It's here awesome. We We're so lucky. Oh, here we go, Rose. Two grannies. There you go. I said it. Two grannies showing up. 10 p.m. Israel time. 5 a.m. Aussie time. Anyway. That's right. Anyway, Rose, you're my hero. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. This is TMS Roundtable Global. I like to say we are global like Corona, but I won't say it anymore. <laughs> I just like to sort of break the ice that way. I know, kick me under the table, Rose. I'm having one of those mm -hmm. days. So yeah, happy exactly. to see you, Rose, and you're going to introduce our wonderful guest tonight. Thanks, Tova. Now, you know, we have got Dale Coverdale. True. Drew. Drew. <laughs> Drew. Oh, my okay. God. There you are. Now, the thing is that he's written an awesome book called The Pain Habit. And in that, oh, that's it, Tova. Thank you. Okay. Now, he's he is from the north of England, and he's affiliated with, um, what is it, um, a university there that have been doing some research on pain. So he's got a broad spectrum of understanding of what's happening in our bodies when we um, report pain. Now, Drew, can you give us a little bit of a bio about what drew you to this? And also a, a bit about your book and a bit about the research. Now, he he drew Tova and I to a concept which we hadn't actually seen per se, and that's called idea motor signal. E I D E A E O E O Motor. motor. Signal and the fact that nodding and emo in, and um, hand movements and that t are our body's way of telling us things. So, is that right, please, Rose? Welcome, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, okay, welcome, Drew. Thank you for coming and tell us a little bit about yourself. He's a physio physiotherapist, by the way, folks. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. I'm not too sure if you've had anybody on with uh, imposter syndrome before, but maybe I'm the first because I'm, I'm almost, if I'm a little bit excited, it's because I've watched your shows for a while and uh, I feel my palms sweating a little bit. So I've got a, a sympathetic response going on at the moment. So please slow me down if I gabble. See it as kind of a hidey. Now you know how I feel every week. <laughs> so, and if my dialect, I might have been the most northern guest you might have had on uh, in the northeast of England. And it's eight o'clock UK time here. So please feel free to ask me to clarify or, or slow down if I, if I do get a little. Thanks, in. Drew. That's lovely. Thank you so much. So Thank I'm you. a physiotherapist and I have been for uh, 24 years. Uh, I've been married for 24 years and they've both been very exciting careers with their ups and downs. I've survived both careers so far. And uh, I, I like Tova. I listened to your story when Dan invited, Dan Ratner invited you onto his show. And I was fascinated by uh, Rose, your story into the kind of profession and or this field of work and the same with Tova's. And we've all come to it, not from a... Um, from a, a career target to say, I want to work with yeah. people with chronic pain from day one. We seem to have evolved to that point. It's a journey, yeah. maybe through our own pains or struggles or joy. But mine's the same, really. And after 20 years as a, as a traditional physiotherapist in the UK system, so we have a national health service that's free, and you see whoever comes through the door. And in, in the in 20 years ago, services for chronic pain were quite limited some might say they are now i wouldn't i think they are moving in the right directions in all services but in the nhs it's a numbers game you do what you can but you don't have the time i think you need to have with patients with chronic pain and that was my experience back then so you do your best you'd use whatever range of techniques or in those days there was machines you'd roll up and use them and classes you put people in but there was always a, a failure out of the system I felt the failure personally as I discharged someone who you know was left left with pain wasn't really influenced in a positive way by anything I did and uh, maybe kind of blame myself a little bit sometimes I might have blamed the patients um, for not joining in or not being compliant but I realized blame isn't helpful in this game at all 
it's understanding that we're all searching for the answer and until i could find that i had to just accept that i'd done everything i could so i moved into private practice about 16 years ago and um, i had a fairly senior position in the hospital probably as as high as i could have gone it's classed as an extended scope physio i could inject mri scans and x-rays and work with the consultants and would list patients for surgery so i kind of rode the wave of those promotions and then thought i'm going to work into private practice for my wife and children and maybe a lifestyle that maybe the financial gains of the nhs weren't offering me the patients are the same it's it was very um just, it was just right for me and uh, i had the same proportion of patients that it couldn't help you know 80 percent respond well to most forms of physiotherapy irrespective of what tricks you you do you might think that you've got great techniques and one thing or another but there was always this 15 20 percent of patients who didn't respond and the same frustration um even though you think you know as much as you can know it's still sad for the patient to say well i'm we don't quite know why you've got this pain and why it's staying and pace yourself take your tablets when you need maybe get some opinion from pain clinic it may come and go and almost leave with an unfinished sentence and i was left with that thinking maybe that's just the way it is but about four years ago i um i heard of a talking technique for um chronic pain and the way it was presented to me was that you talk to someone for a, it, the session was quite short it was half an hour it can be longer but essentially it can happen in half an hour and the pain would turn off um and, and i've done a master's degree and i've done an honors degree and surrounded myself with certificates in our our in institutions if you like thinking that's knowledge it, it isn't so it really gives you an ego to say that you know more than someone else sometimes and the background to this technique was hypnotherapy based or nlp although it isn't either it's where it originated and it came from someone who isn't medically trained um but he'd done that pathway into his therapy and it's called old pain to go and the person said to me oh yeah um you talk to the patient you say these things and get these signals and then the pain turns off almost like matter of fact now me hearing that as a scientist is like ah, i said what i dismissed it it's not possible so because it's not it was just not possible for me so i couldn't see how it was possible and uh, i left it at that but then a patient sat in my clinic waiting room uh, waiting for his mother actually who's seen my colleague and um he said to me i was at the desk he said have you heard of this old pain to go and this gentleman's called Stephen Blake and it's meant to turn pain off. And I thought that's the second time I've heard this in three months from two separate parts of the universe. I booked that night, he was about half an hour ago doing a course a few weeks later. I thought I booked on the course, I'm going, I don't I don't care. Let me just what. interrupt you for a minute. So if I, if, I, if I write down old pain to go, it would be on the internet? yeah old pain number two old, old pain pain to go to go and the, yeah. name of the, guy, the name of the guy who the stephen with a v stephen blake stephen blair blake blake, blake. okay blake. i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt continue no, that's okay that's so that was how it was presented to me and uh it was Incidentally, it was about 40 minutes away and it was bank holiday. It was the 31st of August, 2017. I think it was a Sunday. And I, I, I went to the room and there was about 12, 15 people. It was made up of, uh, there was a mental health nurse, there was a Reiki practitioner, there was counselors, there was kind of crystal healing, things that, don't normally come into my radar in the nhs uh traditionally trained medical practitioners although i respect they are fully trained it's a different pathway but um and then the gentleman stephen blake presented a lady with fibromyalgia uh he, he talked through the technique it's only a, a 
probably a two or three hours and then the lady came in and um he talked to her did this technique and she opened her eyes and said my pain's gone and i thought i'm not having that i'm not having it it must be his auntie it was a classic kind of oh it must be his auntie is that what you yeah, said yeah, yeah. <laughs> But this is my ego, my skepticism, my resistance to something that maybe is truly wonderful. And then in the afternoon, the the host arranged for 10, 12 people to come in who had chronic pain, shoulder, neck, back, all the classic things have been through the system, fully medically examined. So they were told you have to live with this pain. And everyone got chance to have a go in little threes groups of three two would watch the other go through this kind of script you see this signal and um eight, well, eight nine ten of the twelve two it didn't work uh would op open their eyes at the end of this process it's quite short and say my pain's gone and i was saying what do you it's mean ten ants. he had ten ants <laughs> sorry Sorry, he had ten ants, ants that came to the con. The, the, the yeah, well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> ten stooges, you know. <laughs> um, so I was so skeptical, but it didn't work for my patient. And I, I thought about this. I thought, well, is it me? And it didn't work for someone else. And Stephen Blake came and talked to my patient, and he said, "Oh, sometimes the resistance is there that it's futile," and that was fine. It's not for everyone, and it is like it's a treatment, like any treatment not for everyone so i came home and um i came home and i'll tell you this i mentioned this the other day to you but i have to share this story because um it's uh for old pain chronic pain that we would term persistent pain or chronic pain and my daughter who was 17 at the time she said how was it boss and i said it was interesting but a bit weird apparently you talk you see this script and it reduces pain or takes it away said shall we do it and in the kitchen of my house and I, I worked in clinics and hospitals and private practice this is the kitchen in my house <laughs> my daughter with a neck that's seven years of neck pain that would come and go and she'd get a little bit of physio treatment it would settle down and I retrospectively it always came at exam time or it came when she had a new set of friends uh, retrospectively although I didn't recognize it then and uh, my 10 year old son was there my wife was watching and my daughter's boyfriend it's a practically a script you go through this is all pain new pain's necessary old pain's not uh it's an old program when you talk directly to the subconscious mind through a mechanism of an idiomotor signal so if we agreed with each, each other we all might nod or you might you can set up a sway or you can use a finger lift <clears throat> where the person does this movement consciously and after that they're told not to consciously move you're simply asking them to connect to that unconscious part of their mind to ask for a signal for yes and essentially you're framing the pain as something that's not needed anymore it was needed when it started and would you be willing to delete this old program and you go through a little series of questions and the person kind of answers with the movement that you've set up for them. Was her eyes closed and she would just, her eyes closed while you're talking? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to as a technique, but so my daughter would kind of close her eyes. But before this, I said, show your mum how far you can turn your head because her neck had been bad at that time. And incidentally, it was probably before she was going back to college, back to school, which fits you two will understand that completely. And she turned her head and she winced. And then she, I said, well, sh move your arm. And she took it so far and winced. I said, I'm not going to touch you. We went through this process. And um, she, it, one of the movements is a sway. And she used this sway. She said, what? you just join in. You've almost got to be ready to let go. And she opened her eyes. She said, what have you done? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the pain's gone. And I said, gone? she said yeah and uh, i said turn your head for mum and uh she turned her head like the girl off the exorcist it was kind of <laughs> and and uh lift your arm and she lift her arm up she had more range of movement than olga komenech 
I'm Nadia Kamenech, Olga Corbett, and <laughs> like the old gymnast, Russian gymnast. And my wife went, what is that? My wife went, do it to me, do it to me. My, my 10 year old son said, how's that daddy? My, girl, my daughter's boyfriend, that was a bit of a scientist, I was. I said, that's weird. My wife said, could you apply that in practice? And, and my practice is a traditional physiotherapy outpatient uh, service and very successful on, on any, if you're a young physiotherapist and you want a private practice, and I, I'll say it factually, it's, it's a couple of hundred patients a week, 200 patients a week, and uh, you don't have to work hard on the numbers to know it's a success in the northeast of england you can have a healthy life on that sort of turnover i don't need to take any risks i thought i was 48 i could have happily sailed off into the sunset but something inside me thought if this is something i could apply in a physio setting wow wow and i thought carefully about it I'm a businessman and uh, why why ruin my business? My wife would be kicking me out if if I ended up having five patients a week instead of two hundred. <laughs> but so I went to watch the training again with somebody else delivering the information. The mental health nurse who hosted the first course, he was trained as a trainer. He did the same thing, same results. I went then to watch another trainer. 200 miles in the country, watched him again, different trainer, same content, same results. So almost like triangulation. I thought, and, and I saw the subjects on each of the days, eight out of 10, 12 out of 10, people who aren't specifically medically trained, simply following a script, but you've got very compliant patients turning up, very compliant, and there's a subset of patients it could be successful with. So. I started to apply it in clinic with patients that came with one thing, but would incidentally say, I've injured my shoulder three or four weeks ago, and you and I know that that'll get better, whether you, oh, you rub chocolate on their arm or you tell them to do exercise, they'll get better. But they would say, I've also got this back problem that I'm not here to, for you to help me with because no one can help you with that. And I say, listen, I've got nothing to lose, neither of you. Are you interested in this approach that sometimes can help? It's a subconscious program. If you can, it's like pressing the fire alarm on a fire in a, on a, in a house where the fire was a year ago. And if you went in that house and the alarm was on, you'd say, oh, gosh, this is awful. Why is the alarm on? Well, if I said, oh, the fire was a year ago, but the alarm's still on, if I said to you, can I help you reset that? And it won't take long. There's not many people who wouldn't accept. Exactly. And that's the pitch. That was the pitch. And not many people said no. Some did, though. Some said what? That you can turn it off. I said, well, not for everyone. Shall we have a go? And I started to get results. And it fascinated me. So I do the technique. I had no confidence in it. None. And uh, it puts you back to as if you're a practitioner again on your first day with your first patient and all your insecurities kind of, woohoo, they're just behind you. And uh, so, so uh, I was, I'd sweat. I've stopped sweating, by the way. I must have calmed down a little. <laughs> but uh, I would sweat. I'd be nervous. The patients open their eyes and say, I said, move then. How are you feeling? And they'd move the neck or the back and say, when it was successful, it's, they would say it's gone. So what, what do you mean it's and gone? The beauty of this is they can do it themselves. Once they learn it, they can do it, right? Yeah, once it's done, though, Tova, it doesn't come. It's gone. It doesn't go, like like yeah. roses. Once the program's deleted and it's attached to elation, it's the fee is gone. And so what I, what I was thinking, I've got this amazing thing, and I was the only physiotherapist in the country. Not many people are trained in it. There's, it's still a little known technique because there's no research for it. But really, just talking to someone without trance, that's the fascinating part of, thing, part of it. People think you access the unconscious mind through repetition, which is actually not fully true. I'll come back to repetition later when we talk about habit formation. Um, or they think you have to hypnotize someone. You don't, you don't. You talk directly to it, but the person has to be open to that potential. 
and whether it is the unconscious you're talking to whether it is some just seemingly ritualistic procedure that you take someone through the results appeared to be quite stunning now as i said um i thought what should i do this information and i rose you're halfway around the world from me totally not far as far away again i suppose but you have heard of professor laura mosley and his work and i thought who is the biggest person in the world that i know with regards to pain and he's the man isn't he so i thought well i'm going to send him an email in the middle of the night to say what i've told you there the email more or less consisted of what i've just said i thought i probably won't get a reply i'll throw it to someone who maybe has research teams and they might study the technique and do a study i'm very naive really looking back he wrote back the next day thank you so much it sounds so exciting uh, but i get a hundred of these emails a month and um it's just a guru led uh voodoo -y kind of I'd, you know it's quite it was pleasant but it's a dismissive email uh, it needs a randomized controlled trial to see if it's worth and he's totally right totally right i'm sorry to pour water on such enthusiasm but that's the reality of the situation I replied back and said, I'm so grateful to have had, uh, been dismissed by one of the most eminent pain scientists in the world. I'm happy I've saved the email. <laughs> and he, he replied, replied back, good answer. We had a little bit of crack and he, he did explain the reality that nothing gets bro broken through mainstream uh, processes without research. And um, it was either an anecdote that I kind of keep, I thought, I do have a bit of fire in my belly, I do, and I was a footballer, and then that ended, I had to substitute it with something, which became physio, and, um, you know, being driven like that comes with its risks, but I very luckily, throughout this journey, I have a beautiful wife, and four amazing children that always, I recognise, have always given me balance to that very driven uh, trait. Um, but I thought, I'm, I'm going to push with this. And I thought, who do I know in the UK then? Uh, and there's a professor, Cormac Ryan, who's the chair of the Physiotherapy Pain Association. And he's doing a very similar kind of tour around the UK, like the pain revolution, where they cycle around towns and spread the word. Well, in the UK, that's starting too. And I taught with Cormac. I set up a master's degree course in manual therapy, gosh, years ago at Teesside University and we did some teaching together then and um, by this time I'd filmed a few of these patients 10 years no pain 15 years no pain before and after the session same session uh, or immediately after and I sent in them I said Cormac this appears to be something strange what what do you think about it he said what are you doing I said I'm just talking to them he said what the hell are you saying to them <laughs> He, and so we talked, we had some meetings. He got a Dr. Alistair McSween involved because I'm I wanted this to be objective, otherwise, it's just anecdotal. So I showed them the stuff. They did came and saw the course twice because I was I can train people in it. And uh, he said, Let's do a study. We put ethics in about two years ago. We did a small pilot study just with 22 patients of one year history of low back pain with with or without leg pain and uh, the results are really encouraging you can't say what happened from that was anything to do with the technique in scientific terms it's far too small it could be me it could be could have been my looks that helped them it could have been <laughs> i just want to, i want to interrupt again and say you know dr sarno may he rest in peace well we said i don't need research i i see the results I understand. I full uh, exactly, and I felt like that. But I know that I know the academic systems. Mm -hmm. I know the hospital systems. And listen, in the professional circles that you, us three work, people will always say, "Where's the research?" They will. They will always come to you with that. And it's a it's it it's a thin layer of ice to kind of to kind of uh, say that the effects are due to that. So uh, we, we submitted two publications have been rejected twice, but we're submitting to a third, but independent of whether that paper gets published or not, um, we've bid for a quarter of a million pound, the bid's in, 
to use that approach with a randomized control trial with a local university and the university and i wouldn't be involved as a as a uh deliverer of the approach so i have no vested interest you could say i did if i was a trainer but i don't really train people that much in it at the moment and um so it's independent so it's got to that point it's after four years and it still might not get accepted but that's the journey in uh, research so it was from that technique seeing it work so amazingly that made me think well it's there is an opportunity there but even with the amazing success sometimes of that technique it didn't help everyone and i would do the technique in front of 10 or 15 physios and uh, someone i'd never met uh, so i was really up against it um these are people who could shoot me down they wouldn't but they've known me for a long time and that was the only credibility that got them in the room drew's doing this weird stuff but we know him and he knows his stuff let's give him a chance so for me to say that to them and show them and for it to appear to work started to create some interest but some patients it didn't last and some patients it didn't work at all but then i got calls of patients four months six months later and said do you know my pain did go and i realized that there's a longer journey for some people and a shorter journey and so that's not my technique. I was interested in it and it was my entry point. But then I started to study uh, Georgie's work and Dr. Sarno's work and um, recognize that it can be just as quick in those mechanisms, just as quick, or it can be a journey. That just read the book. They heard what he said. They read the book and said, I heard what you said. You told me it could go away if I go, if I travel from my head to my heart and it went away. It's like similar. Yeah. So, so seeing that, I thought there is a process. So I studied the behavior science literature, the talent code, uh, the power of habit, BJ Fogg's work, uh, atomic habits, uh, zeb why zebras don't get ulcers, all of the kind of psychology, physio, behavior science. And I thought um, BJ Fogg uh, describes habit formation as, um, as, a, as a link to emotion rather than repetition. And that's the key. Uh, that's the key for me and he's not a medical person but he did say i don't know how this works with pain and when i read that i thought oh it, it, it just needs translating into pain translating so what's the key? What's, this would be so this, this was the impetus for your book what you're talking yeah, about that was so intellectually you can see that i'm gathering lots of information mm. and helping people with chronic pain when i never thought i could and um but I then i experienced my own pain my own pain and I remember this is a, uh, I'm not saying it's a high octane life, but I have some of the traits that you see in patients with chronic pain, they're very driven and well, we can talk about that later, but you know, those traits and, but I had that balance, you know, so a busy clinic, another, I had six clinics actually at one point and you know, it was crazy then, but I had kind of scaled back and we always had that balance um i ran the kid my 10 year olds football team two nights a week on a and played on played on a sunday a uh, daughter at university two other son three other sons and my wife kind of did a bit of part-time work and the balance was just lovely but um a few things happened a few things happened and uh so my wife kind of wanted to leave the work she was doing um my one of my sons was kind of doing a 15 year old was doing things probably a 15 year old shouldn't have done but we've all been 15 but even but that'll now, do it <laughs> and it was a bit on the edgy side uh which was a challenge my 17 year old wasn't sure what to do with his life and you feel your children's pain sometimes don't you and my daughter needed some help at university and financially so there was kind of some extra triggers and a sense and i needed to step back from the busyness i had and then my dad came towards the end of his life and it was predictable it was six months left maybe maybe a little longer but it was predictable and um, i stayed in all of that those situations trying to fix them all probably a little bit too long and when we stress we always use our default behavior we go towards safety yeah we do the behavior that makes us feel safe and for me it wasn't i couldn't run or do professional football anymore but, so where do you think i i kind of buried myself well it was work wasn't it it was always going to be work i was I was safe at work, asking people how they are, attending to them, 
uh, can I help you and stay a bit later and do another report and I get a phone call can you come home and are you coming back and I'd be engrossed in the old paint to go or the groups there I was just hiding from not being able to control that situation and I got pain that um, you call plantar fasciitis yeah heel pain it was there for six months plus and I, I didn't stretch I didn't do anything I just knew it wasn't going to kill me I didn't know why it had come and he's me studying everything. I didn't see, I couldn't see anything. Just kept on going, kept on going. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> and uh, my wife said, stop to me one night. And we, it was a challenge. It, the situation was challenging. It was really challenging, which I'm sure you understand. Uh, and she said to me, you can help people with all these pains and you can't see the cause of your own. Beautiful. And, um, wow, how about that? Take your wind out your sails. And uh, you didn't have to say anymore. She was kind of exhausted by me. Uh, and my lack of involvement in the things that I should have been involved in. And I paused and I, I realised I could see. It, it, it kind of, it was so clear. Yeah. And I realised what I could control, what I couldn't control, what I had to accept, what I needed to do, maybe, um, what I needed to put right. And the next morning, I got out of bed and I didn't have the pain in my foot. I didn't do any technique. I didn't do any old pain to go. I didn't do, you know, these techniques are amazing. Your wife was talking to your body and you responded with the yes. Yeah, you're right. Exactly, Tova, exactly. And she, but Sheila told me dozens of times before then, probably, but we don't, we're not with our partners to, I realized we're not with our partners to listen to them. <laughs> That's true. We're, we're with them to be with them. This yeah. is turning into marriage counseling. It's, it's we're brilliant. Not, <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not to listen to, we're there to be with, just be with them. And yeah. so my pain stopped. So I sorted my son, helped sort my son. It wasn't overnight. I kind of enjoyed the football. So I'm, the I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scooch you. I'm gonna focus you a little bit because you're just like me. You're like, whoa, we got so much to say. But I want to know how this book came about because I want to sure. know the truth. Okay. About chronic pain. So, right. So that moment means I, 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 uh, I've got to apply it myself. Yeah, and sort out what I needed to sort. I recognised the connection between pain and stress. It almost galvanised it. It's easy to see in others, not so easy to see in yourself. So I'm good. I thought I need to document this in a way that is understandable to a 12-year-old boy. Wow. So the British press, uh, some of the, uh, most of the British press is written to the age of a 12-year-old boy. Okay, there's a couple of broadsheets about 15 year old, but most of them are 12 year old. Harry Potter, do you know the reading age of Harry Potter? What? 12 year old. Oh, 12 year old. Yeah, 12 year old. So I thought, right, it's that's because you can accept or reject ideas at that age. And I thought it needs to be non technical. There has to be some, it's a complex subject, but it has to be written in a way that a 12 year old boy can understand it. So I started to document the way I trained all pain to go, the introduction and what pain's about and how we learn it. And um, I started to integrate some of the habit forming mechanisms and how the behaviors create the pain. And then the pain itself creates automated responses that continue to perpetuate the pain. And I kept running the ideas past my 10 or 11 year old son. He went, yeah, I get that, dad. And I put it in the book. <laughs> put it in the book. He was my first editor. And uh, yeah, I got it peer reviewed by my friend in Norway, Einstein, who I mentioned in the book from a physio perspective. He went through, I get it completely, wow. get it completely. And then I got an editor in America who's uh She's a lovely lady, amazing woman, who, who kind of did the technical editorial. And, I, and I, I would have written this book, but after my dad passed away and the British lockdown, I thought, well, now's the time. Ready, go, set. Don't wait until you're ready. You'll never do it. I just I wrote it. And um, um, it's, some, it's one of the, apart from my wife and my children, it's probably one of the biggest achievements of my life. Wow. 
fantastic beautiful it's so clever it's so clever where you have the uh you know the, the it's like what you explain this in the book where you had the um you know not important what I, what i want to ask you uh, rose did you have a question you go ahead rose no i'm listening oh well, well i'm interrupting so i want to hear more about the truth you so the tell tr the truth yeah the truth so the truth in my it's only my in my honest opinion and my humble opinion uh, is that a pain doesn't represent uh it doesn't represent the damage the physical damage we always believe that uh it initially presents like pain is simply a signal for you to attend to you wow yeah yeah lovely the brain only uses pain in very in four very simple ways to alert you not that you're damaged but to attend to yourself wow. two very simple mechanisms is uh if, if all three of us chose not to drink water for the next 12 hours we'll get a range of symptoms and pain somewhere will be at the end and the pain's there not to tell us we're damaged it's saying that's enough because beyond this is organ failure and death in a few days if it's food we're not eating within a, a, a day or two you'll have a different pain in your possibly in your stomach we all have a different association but it's very very logical the brain the waters i don't know the brain is so much percent water so it makes sense if you haven't got water your brain to wake uh, we we digest food in our stomach so if you if it needs a nourishment you'll feel it in your stomach but you're always giving warnings before then so the pain comes with no damage the brain also uses uh, mechanoreceptors receptors for the physical elements so pressure receptors chem chemo receptors and pressure chemicals and what's the other one thermal thermal receptors and if you hold your hand on a radiator for so long you'll you'll find you put your finger on it will get hotter, 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 hotter. You might keep it on as long as you want, but the, the body will trigger physical pain before there's tissue damage. So water, food, physical elements, they're all pain, and you have to interpret each of them. Which we're, all, we're pretty good with food and water. We're pretty good with physical elements, usually acute. But when it's a slow burn, um, the other category that the brain uses is uh, fear or it's measuring adrenaline and cortisol so as that mechanism senses that going upwards um, it has the ability the brain to trigger pain at a certain threshold so if you allow yourself to be in a situation of being what feels like you've been chased by a tiger for too long and remember our cultural systems our sorry our pain system built in a cultural time when we didn't have all that we have now to trigger our stress if you felt pain it's because there was a bite a sting a twist a turn an animal biting you or a fight now uh, our fight or flight response is triggered by cultural social psychological emotional elements that are so more uh, blurry than they were hundreds of thousands of years ago so they are kind of uh, a patient said to me i tiptoed into this didn't i it's so invisible that in those people that have a quite a high set point in terms of how they run and that might be related to some childhood issues it may not be but uh, they could have had trauma in adulthood um, but they run at quite a high tempo either through fear or frustration or anger or whatever is driving that or what belief sits underneath that and that's often invisible so when the life that brings stress to all of us tips that person's cup they sometimes think that they can deal with more than others because they're not really sensing those earlier thresholds that kind of come come yeah. come wow so well explained so yeah. the tipping point is very narrow the tipping point is narrow and as pain uh fires in that moment of high stress you've got somebody who the blood is in the reflex part of their brain by definition so they're not with their thinking brain 
because in the chase from the lion, these are very simple neurophysiological mechanisms. The blood's squeezed out of your stomach when your foot's on the start line on sports day, and it happens so fast that we call this butterflies, yeah? The, the, uh, the blood rushes to your arms and legs in preparation for the chase from the lion. Your eyes focus on the finish line. The brain doesn't need to have blood in the thinking brain, so it squeezes the capillaries into the reflex brain. Your, your long-term immune system shuts down. It's not interested in fighting off a cold. Your digestion system's already switched off because there's no point digesting your breakfast when a lion's chasing you. Because as Bruce Lipton says, he'll be chewing on your breakfast once he's finished with you. <laughs> it means that um, that state is perfect for the race, for the fight, for the argument, for the moment, for sport, to do the presentation and come out of it. But it's not meant to be used every day and every night, every day and every night. But in these people who are very perfectionist, controlling, self-sacrificing, uh, people pleasers, great game face, uh, they just don't see themselves as stressed. They don't recognize how close they are to that tipping point. And when pain comes, it comes because the organism is sensing such a threat to the actual survival of them as a being it triggers pain and when the person feels the pain they are looking for the bite the sting the twist the turn they'll say it's my mattress it's my age it's the wind it's my weather it's my my, my, my mother's middle name's margaret um it's my this it's my that you've got to be so careful who you show your pain to in that moment so careful because if if it's fooling you and it fools the next person Oh my word, trouble awaits. And the, the reason that pain comes like that isn't to punish the person who has all this stress, it's to, to, to distract them from staying focused on the thing that is triggering that stress, one thing or lots of things. And the systems that better feel the pain is the one that's been overloaded or it's the one that's been neglected. So and it, well explained. If it's the immune system, it could be any disease known to man. You are so lucky if you get pain. You are so lucky. It is the biggest blessing you'll ever receive wow. if you can start to see it because it's the last chance saloon. Go beyond pain. Go through pain. See it as something to fight, be frustrated about, angry about, and push through it. Read some of Gabor Mate's work and you'll see it leads to a lot more than just pain. And if we can change our perspective to say, not I've got all of this happening and now my back's bad, it's to look at that and say, I've got all this on and this is how my body's responding and I've maybe missed the earlier cues. But that takes a calm head. And, and as an adult, uh, depending on the lessons we learned in childhood, which should have been in the moment of stress to, with the, with the catastrophe, cat, catastrophizing thoughts, the uh, heightened breath rate, the guarded movement and the feeling of pain, it needs each of the four categories to be altered. Change one of them and you change the pain. Change all four and you, you can change your life. And with chronic pain, they are stuck with the... Uh, catastrophic thinking the uh they're not aware of the rate they're breathing at most of the time there's a very guarded movement with the predictive coding as uh, that howard schubert describes perfectly yeah. they anticipate pain so they're firing before it's actually um present yeah. but that means if you look at a functional mri scan you would see that pathway of fire before the person experiences the event. And the output is pain. So um, they feel pain. So to slow that person down, to give them different thoughts, different breathing pattern, different movements, or a different expression of that emotion, because pain is an emotion, essentially. But people, people attach a negative emotion to pain, but don't realize that 
pain is that emotion. And the more negative they feel about the pain, the more they amplify the emotion originating and perpetuating the pain. It's a cycle that's almost invisible to them. Ask them if they're contributing to it and they'll say, it's not me. And, it, and this means that it's a very careful balance to say there is no blame. It's about being able to accept responsibility. Again, Gabo Mate beautifully says, are you able to, do you have the ability to respond differently? And if you can be the person to galvanize that, a lot of what we do is simply a, a catalyst for the person to change themselves. We, we don't do anything to people they allow themselves to change sometimes the need someone to bounce off and to, to challenge those thoughts and to be guided in that process and rose you have your techniques to do it and tova you have yours and i'm, I'm just a kind of one other person plowing this uh, pathway but i feel such uh, solidarity uh, with you two if you're in the room now i would hug you both i wouldn't even ask consent no um, mask. No mask. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just hug you. I'd apologise, but I feel connected. It's a comforting place to be. And for me, again, you know, I'm 24 years as a physio, and uh, whatever reputation I have as a physio, I know it makes it more vulnerable to talk like this and to put stuff out there that's, you know, worthy of challenge. But I'm happy to fight my corner not enough to try and convince someone who doesn't believe but you know I researched I researched the book well I looked at a broad range of kind of uh, approaches to it I tried to present it in a balanced way that's non-judgmental to the reader be in pain keep the pain if it serves a purpose that's more protective than the pain you're running away from or don't not aware of I get that completely but uh, it's really to express the point that you do not need to live in persistent or chronic pain. And if you're prepared to take the steps, it doesn't have to happen, to happen quickly. It, there's a route out of it. You just need to find the right person for you or the right information, not necessarily my book or anyone else's book. You just There's an opportunity there that I didn't think was possible before, but it is possible. And I see it every single day. So, Drew, tell us how you actually now deal with a patient when they come in. Someone well, call, calls you up, makes an appointment, and I presume you look at their presenting problem. Just run us through yeah. now, just for any other uh, therapists or um, physios or OTs that are uh, watching. So we, we all, you'll, if you watched everybody taking a, a personal patient's intake, we, we all take that name, address, de develop rapport, uh, whichever way feels intuitive and uh, so i would take a history uh present history and a subjective history you look at where the pain is uh, the past medical history and the social history so that's kind of a, a quick potted history but what i do now that i never used to is i i listen to the metaphors i listen to how they describe the pain I uh, look at the past treatments and look at the other, not a list of the previous problems, but um, there's certain collections of uh, pathologies that are very consistent. You'll know them, they're very consistent with uh, the pattern. And I have, to hold, I have to hold myself back sometimes. It's almost like, I, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> I know, miss, miss, I know. No one is nine kids at the back of the class. <laughs> Put down a wait, wait, wait. Let the patient speak. So I, I, I have to wait and listen. But the more you listen, it's, it's in you, the more you look, the less you say, the better. They'll just mm. talk. And at the end, I have a bottom right hand corner, which is kind of social history hobbies uh what oh, what okay. do what, what do you do for you and these i haven't got an assessment sheet i'm at home um you know but it'll be such a busy picture you know the type you know uh, all over and the bottom right hand corner is blank 
I say, what do you do for you? Oh, well, I haven't got time. Oh, well, I'm looking after my mum. Oh, I've got the kids. Well, I've got work on and da da da. And I say, and I, and I will now ask, I said, um, how do you feel about this? Me asking how you feel about something, I didn't understand the word feel. I didn't have emotions in my vocabulary for 48 years <laughs> because it was always structural, uh, yeah. basic, very limited, very, but again, it's just an ego. And, I, and I've so, I'm, I'm very happy with how I'm turning out. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got a lot to do still, but I get it. I get it. I understand myself. I understand myself. I can control my own addictions, if you like, to be to be something uh, for someone else's approval. But um, I, I can just shine the picture back to the patient and Love. say, look, there is some evidence that a lot of these uh conditions are, are linked to how you feel and how stressed you are and i will challenge them on the on the appearance of the pain as a physiotherapist uh movements and patterns of movement and descriptions of pain i'm quite clear on and um i'm quite clear on so if rose you're a patient and you said to me drew my back pain came on six months ago and nothing happened Okay, okay, Rose, that's that's fine. But so um, there was no trauma. And they say, well, I don't think so. Well, if there was trauma, you should be saying to me, um, I fell down the stairs, I had a car crash, I got out of the car, come, someone kicked me in the back, <laughs> and I got home and my husband hit me with a hammer in my back. You, there should be lots of trauma to equate to, pain. To the level of pain as well. Right, to the level of yeah. pain, based on that logic. But if um, if that did happen on that day, all of those kind of bizarre parody descriptions I'm making, well, all the, t the tissue healed within three months. Right, the tissue healed within three months. So we can establish that there's no trauma. Um, so then we're looking for overload. Overload, you should be saying to me, Drew, the day before I woke up, I moved two tonne of topsoil on my own and the next morning my back was aching. That would make sense. Even if that happened, the tissue overload has settled within three months and your pain's there six months. So I, I, I'm quite frank with them and I say, uh, Rose, the only structural cause for persistent pain after six months is cancer, an autoimmune disease an undiagnosed fracture or an ongoing infection. And I said, you don't have any of them. And if you did, and when someone's got five years and 10 years and 15 years, I say, and if you did, you'd have been a long time dead. And all the people, <laughs> I I'm straight. I say, <laughs> I said, and then you've, I said, you've been assessed by a lot better people than me. And they've all checked for those things. Oh. And well, I'm quite frank. And they, so um, I'll say, but what happens when that's happened? No trauma and no obvious overload. And I say, there's overload. There's overload. I said, but it's so invisible. It's so invisible that you haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. And there'll be something in your life. I think this isn't scientific. I think there's something in your life uh, about for at least three months that you're carrying on with your dealing with you're putting up with or you've repeated the feelings and memories and emotions of and in the moment that that happens we should be getting those calming words calming thoughts hugs care attention being listened to and said so that hasn't happened and because you've not allowed yourself to recover or you've just not had access to those support services to help you do it or the situation's still ongoing and the the brain will just do anything it can to trigger a protective mechanism to take the person out of that. But if you don't even see yourself as being stressed, then why would you make a conscious effort to uh, remove yourself from it? And if someone has a situation like that, a little bit like me, we always remember right from childhood, we encode a behavior that takes us towards safety. So if someone called me ginger nut, you might not be able to see my hair color, 
Oh, okay. kids did it great. Uh, I was, uh, someone would call me ginger as a kid. I would call it Californian blonde. <laughs> they call me grey now. I, I prefer to call this autumn surprise. <laughs> so, um, but imagine a child being called a name and we've all been called a name. We've all been called a name. And that's a, there's a resistance to that. That child doesn't know how to deal with that. And if there isn't anyone around to give them the, the balance to it, they've got to either fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And they use their default. They use their default. And we use our default in adulthood. So man was to run and to prove I'm not who they say I am. And I'm fortunate that that didn't happen a lot. If it happens from your parents delivering that sort of information or your carers, then you've got to repeat the behavior a lot to even survive that environment and maintain, again, this is Gabo Marte's work, to maintain the attachment to the person who's going to ensure your survival until you're long and old enough to escape that situation. And those coping strategies become traits that people identify with. They think it's genetic. Think we're born with them? It's not true. You might have a ge genetic pre -dis -dis uh, predisposition for those things, but not a predetermination, not at all. So we use our defaults, and in a stressful moment in someone's life that might be in their twenties or their thirties, it might be the job loss, the divorce, the grief, the dog dying. It doesn't matter. It just has to it encapsulate three elements uncertainty, uh, lack of information, how to end that uncertainty, and a sense of loss of control in the person viewing that situation. And that's different for all of us. But if that persists, if that persists, the person has to overuse their default behavior. And if man was eating chocolate, I'm not, um, um, if someone had this situation, they'd find that they eat more chocolate. If it was drinking, they'd find they'd drink more alcohol. Sex, drugs, work, exercise. And they hit that activity so much that eventually it starts to trigger their pain. Wow. I'm going to interrupt you for a minute. But go ahead, Rose. Then I'll, then I'll interrupt. Oh, okay. Drew, would you also point out there's a horrible echo or something. Yeah, I think it's from. Um, you have your sound up, Drew. Put your make sure your sound is down. Have a look. That's all. Just that uh, we can hear you. But I wanted to um, mention there were some people making comments, so I wanted just to to chime okay, in, and okay. then we'll we'll okay, could, yeah. Okay, yeah but, uh, just hold on, Tyler. Yeah, Drew, would you, would you explain, explain to any therapists that are watching you now? that your interview doesn't take any longer than your previous treatment. Because that's when, when you talk to um, doctors or uh, therapists and you say, ask the patient about their feelings in your interview, uh, and they say, oh, that will take too long. And the thing yeah. is that you can do all of what you've said within the time span, whether it's 15 or 20 minutes, whatever your time span is, can you elaborate on that a little bit for anyone who's watching? Yeah. So my sessions are about 30 minutes. Um, how's that for the Is that? A terrible echo. Hang on, I'll turn it. Is that any better? I think it's yes. better. Yeah. You know. I'll say. How's that? Is any better? Yeah, quieter. There's not as much noise in the background now. Let's try that. So um, my session is about half an hour as a traditional physio. Uh, I, I don't think it's quite... Every, excuse me, you're everything but traditional. Oh, thank you. But, you know, a physio. Stuff. So people come to me wanting physio. And if I recognise there's uh, other things, it probably needs more time than that. If I was doing this online, I'd block out an hour and a half, right? Because people come for that, but normally they'll just come for physio. So, I, it's, it, it, but you can find the information in half an hour. 
they can well, find the information in 10 yeah. or 15 minutes if you ask the right questions. Yeah, that's uh, what it's so about, isn't it? Wrong. Sorry, sorry, Rose. The, it's the right questions to ask is where uh, I'm coming from. Yes, so you'll, yeah. you'll hear people on the phone and you'll know if you I'm making an appointment, I've got this and that. You'll you'll tell you'll hear that they're up there. You'll hear that they're there. Um, so you'll see me get excited as I talk about this. I'm going to slow down again and just just appreciate where I am. Have a bit of gratitude for being in both of your companies and maybe listen a bit more than I'm talking. <laughs> I've had a moment, but but I've just paused for a moment. But because I I recognise that there's so much to tell a patient, but you. That it, you have a finite moment of time to create that. Remember, these are people with very different beliefs to what you are presenting. Very challenging, and I, I you know, I present this to physios. They'll say, "Nah, nah," and patients who are scared. It's like an injured animal. If there was an injured animal in the room, and all three of us went to stroke it, it will growl at one bite the other it would lick rose because she's got such a kind face but it would probably bite me and it might growl at tova but you know it's it's reacting isn't it it's reacting yeah. so you're presenting ideas you've got to be very careful that you don't present your excitement they'll just see that as a threat yeah because yeah. they're picking up on my excitement so I, i'm i am calm i'm joking i am calm but once we get the breakthrough in the person's eyes, they say, what do you mean? I get it. It's since I was divorced five years ago or since I lost my mum or grief's a huge one. I'm not a grief counsellor, but I can be compassionate and say, well, there's the context. And I say to them, actually, with grief, it's the only pain that I think you should keep. But you don't need to keep it at that level. I said I would hate to not feel some pain if I thought about my dad who died two years ago in 10 years for it just to be a memory oh my dad died yeah that fella <laughs> it doesn't make sense yeah you want to feel once a year Beautiful. or when you go to the club where you used to sit together or you walk by the river and you feel the presence or whatever it is for someone pain is comforting so, exactly it's about yeah pain pain uh, or grief is is a comfort, isn't it, really? But yeah. I, where I'm coming from is the whole idea of, of a therapist being able to still work within their parameters initially because if you if you had a patient that came in and they made those connections, you'd make a new appointment if, if you needed. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, but... and that's the difference between having confidence to actually ask people those sort of yeah. questions. Yeah. If you don't ask... Um, you don't ask, you won't hear back, will you? And you don't look, you won't see. And exactly. there's always a way through. Never mind how much time you have with someone. Make a connection. Get them to engage with you. And this comes to, as we, I suppose, you step towards habit formation. If someone's ready to change, if they're not, you, you just you do what you do with them. Yeah. Whether chiropractic, whether that's massage, whether that's physio or acupuncture, these are all therapeutic things that the person needs in that moment. Um, it may not help them escape the longer term issue, but it's help. It's it's what they're asking for. So who should we be to deny them of that? So it isn't an either or. It at least gives you an opportunity to build rapport and say, well, have you thought about the pattern of your pains? Mm. You know, there's some of the work we can do. You know, there's yeah. some of the techniques more than me just touching you. But remember, it's think, breathe, move and feel. So I've already got an in with movement. That's how they've come to see me. I can easily show them a breathing technique that feathers nicely into all of our practices. We'll all use breathing techniques, I'm sure. They don't, they're not defined by my profession. But neither are the touch techniques and thoughts. Well, we are all allowed to discuss uh, their pain from our perspective in a soft way. That, and we're all allowed to say, well, how do you feel about that? And I'm not a psychologist and I don't profess to be able to explore uh, moments of the past in any with any expertise. But my dad said to me once, "You, the only thing you get from looking back, son, is a stiff neck. Now, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm glad he joined us tonight in the in the, in this roundtable. He's 
I'm happy to have him. I, I want to just get. I want to just interrupt you like a very rude co-host. I'm sorry, but I, I want. I don't want anyone to leave before they get their questions answered. Oh, so, sorry, Tom. <laughs> okay, yeah. First of all, um, is your is your book available in digital format? Yes, an audiobook, ebook, and paperback. On on Amazon.com. Yeah, Audible, Amazon, Amazon.co.uk. Okay. Wherever the. Yeah. That was for Lori. Thank you, Lori. And um, I just want to I just want to review. I just want to mention this beautiful Daniel Lewis said absolutely amazing explanation made my night and maybe my year. I've literally taken everything you've said in with certain things you've said that's made me realize that TMS is a lot easier to beat than what it seems. Thank you so much. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. that's, that's lovely. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. And, um, yeah. What Paul, Paul Smith's son, is yeah. what Drew is saying true of whiplash when you were talking about. Um... Yes. Yes. So what, what often happens with pain when it's persistent is that when pain fires with an emotion, it wires to that emotion. OK, but it is that emotion. But if you uh, think of how we experience pain in childhood, emotional pain or physical pain, we run to our caregiver with blood on our finger or uh, uh, tears from being called ginger. And uh, we're guarded, we breathe in fast and we feel pain. They tell us we're going to be okay. It's all right. The blood's to clean the wound. Um, your friends make up. Um, if it's a, you split up from your girlfriend, it's something like, I never liked her anyway. There's more fish in the sea. And... Uh, you're, big, you're better than her. Whatever it is, you're given skills to repeat to yourself. And um, you're told to slow your breathing. Take a deep breath with mummy. Take a deep breath. Or dad. Uh, move, move your arm. You've got to trust that person. But remember, they've told you all the lies that uh, you've ever heard before you're seven. Santa Claus, the man in the moon, the tooth fairy. And some of you have been told the boogeyman. And so you believe them when they say move your arm a little bit, even though you don't want to. Predictive coding, it will hurt. Small boundary, move for mommy or daddy. They'll look for the pain. Uh, they'll say, go back to your friend, it's going to be okay. You go a little bit and say, I'm sorry, and expect you, uh, accept your role within the situation to take control. And, um, and then uh, you'll feel differently. That, that moment of going back into the environment where that pain injury happened or event happened or the pain was experienced is um, fearful and there's a danger in that moment we stay on mum's knee now we all as parents if you've been lucky enough to be a parent or if you've lucky enough to have had parents know that you've got to get off the knee get back on the bike get back with a friend accept your role in what happened and learn from it and we encode every pain for the rest of our life like that but the emotions get detached from it quite quickly but it, as an adult or without the training for that we repeat the scary thoughts we yeah. breathe in the same pattern we play the guided movement and we just feel the same emotion over and over and over again now when you repeat stressful when you repeat behaviors with an emotion it is not the repetition that wires that as a habit it is the intensity of the emotion present with the behavior. So if it's one moment of high emotion, the behavior is wired in that moment. Right. How many times do you need to experience the pain of grief of a loved one to know what the next one will feel like? Once. So How many times do you need to burn your hand on a cooker? Yeah, so you're what? saying that with whiplash, the, the whiplash people should not have chronic whiplash. It's not. So, so that's a, a, a massive moment of grief or physical injury. Take whiplash; it's traumatic. Uh, generally, it's the people who've been hit, not the people who hit them. Right? People who hit them, they don't get whiplash. Right? Oh. It's the people who are hit. I hear people who are hit, who get the whiplash, who get the treatment, who get the care, who get the solicitor's letters, who have the hassle. It wasn't my fault. It's injustice. 
and I've got this problem and I can't do my work, I can't do what I love, I can't do the things. Now, they go to bed with those thoughts, wake up with them. They go to bed with those thoughts, they wake up with them. Do that a sufficient number of time. And you'll with believe the intensity of emotion, you are wiring the pathways together. With it means forever, with flash, well, well, I'll never be able to, I'll need surgery. All the so drama happens, around whiplash, it's terrible. Right, so now this happens not in everyone who suffers whiplash. It happens in a subset of people. They may be the ones with the traits. You might find some correlation in literature with adverse childhood experiences that you've talked around a lot on this these shows. So it's that perfect storm. What was it? What's the combination of things? Or, or did they have a perfect background, but they've lost access to the friends, they've lost access to the loved ones. They haven't got those support structures. And that's why I think anyone can get chronic pain. I think we're all about three months from it. I used to see people in the street, uh, and I've seen them a lot more, even where I live over lockdown, um, you know, begging or homeless. And there's a point in my life that, I, I, again, I, I would probably say, oh, it's their fault then. Now, I think it, there's only three months between me and them. True. There's only three months between me and them. So we have to take responsibility for what we can do. If we haven't got the skills or we haven't got the support structures or we haven't known how to help ourselves, then now's the time to at least learn uh, some of the self-care patterns and habituate them and learning that takes a commitment but it only needs a tiny commitment it, it needs a tiny commitment but um, you Rose you asked me about this the other day how do you habituate a self-care pattern in somebody who just doesn't know how to do this well you are trying to help someone feel better about themselves in essence feel better about themselves. However you describe that as self-care or love or compassion or boundary setting, their skills that they have lost, maybe never had, would have never lost. Never had often, yeah. Yeah, and their pain, if they ask them about the pain, it brings back uh, uncertainty, a lack of information, a loss of control. So every time they focus on the pain, they get those three elements back that define the stress response. Ask them if they're stressed and some will say no. So yeah. their body is stressed, but they can't see it. Yeah. So um, it's getting them to understand that learning how to feel better has to engage the unconscious mind, not the conscious mind. The conscious mind has 40 bits of data per second, its ability to process. The subconscious 40 million bits of data per, se per, per second. You're a 50 trillion cell organism. Wow. More than the stars in the universe inside of you now. Mm. And you're not thinking about your heart rate. You're not thinking about how much you're sweating. Where's my palm? Just a little sweat again. I got excited. It'll go down. Uh, you're not thinking about your blood pressure. You're not thinking about how fast your hair is growing. This is all happening automatically. But what is also automatic, and it's encoded in the brain automatically, is those early mechanisms of the quickest way to feel safe about yourself. And the crazy part of this is that feeling unsafe in childhood, even just once, and running towards safety is encoded as a healthy behavior, protective behavior. But if you run and run and run away from the grief or the divorce or the sadness or the bullying so much, the brain recognizes the organism is becoming overloaded and it short circuits the behavior by triggering pain. Oh, the pain Drew, you put it beautifully. The, the pain creates the stress response that protects the organism from using the behavior that would have killed the organism wow. because disease or tissue damage awaits beyond pain and yet what does the pain do they're frustrated about it. they're angry with it they're mad about it they're, and that triggers the stress response the brain as an as an or the body as an organism is perfectly happy at least we're alive in pain rather than allowing the behavior 
beyond pain that's a disease. Now to ask someone to learn a new behavior that's as fast as that unconscious 40 million bits of data has to be driven by the dopamine system. The dopamine system is wired when we feel something pleasurable. It's very subjective. You might think of something pleasurable, Tova. You might think of something rose, and I might. It might all give us pleasure. It could be totally different things. Chocolate, shopping, and uh, gin and tonic. Yeah. <laughs> you might like all three. It's a pleasurable. You could, as we think of it, I'll, let's, let's attribute them to each of us. So, Tova, you can have the chocolate. Rose, you're a gin and tonic girl. Uh, at Let's seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, even thinking about it releases dopamine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Your brain, yeah. once it's wired, once it's wired in the pleasure center, your brain knows what that feels like. So if you felt unhappy about something, an argument with your spouse, let's say, or a bad day at work, as you come home, your brain says, how can we quickest feel better? What's the quickest mechanism? And it sees the biscuit tin. It sees the uh, coupon with Amazon, or it sees the gin bottle. Ro Rose is yeah. straight for the gin bottle. Tova's in the chocolate biscuit now, tin. The whiskey, now. I prefer. Eh? Whiskey? Okay. Whiskey, I'm yes. recording this because I need to listen to the skin. <laughs> so that means that this is the fascinating part. So that's where it's encoded. If it's overused, there's a part of the, let's say that program sits in, it's inside the striatum in the brain. Don't worry about where, but it's, it's in the striatum. It's the uh, deep in the brain. It's unconscious, but it, it releases pleasure. Now, if you've done a lot of these things for a while, it moves into the routine section. So the first bit's called the nucleus accumbens, I think. And it moves across in the door, inside the dorsal striatum, which is routine. Just routine. One bar of chocolate, ah, oh, doesn't do it. I need two. Yeah. Or the One, whole bar. It, right, exactly. Because it doesn't give the same hit. Never. The first of anything. Okay, that's ex exactly like um, heroin, isn't it? Yes. Same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So all of these things, you don't have to do them and then define them as exciting. Right? As you, yeah, as you more. feel the chocolate on your tongue. Wow uh shopping uh, not for me uh, but you know i'm joking yeah, shopping. speaking of that i just need to interrupt you because that's what i do really well but anyway <laughs> your friend tony has um some some constructive feedback for you <laughs> <laughs> is that some kind of is he, he's a physical therapist yeah he's a, we used to play football together yeah well anyway yeah, yeah, I think I, I think he used to clean my boots. <laughs> anyway, um, we're, we've had we've had a number of people that I've never met before on our show tonight. So you drew a number of people from the streets to our show, and I'm thrilled. Oh, All these good. new names, and um, Paul Smithson is on chapter six of your book, and um, I haven't I've seen I've met Lori before, but I haven't seen her in a while. And um, uh, Doran, I haven't seen you for a while. So really, I, I just wanted to, to just take a, a minute and say hi to everybody out there. And um, I, I, I think that um, I'm like blown away by the explanations because, you know, Rose and I have been doing this for a year and a half and with the shows and the different explanations. And you have a beautiful way that you express it and explain it. Right. Isn't Absolutely. That true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, really. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to finish reading the book. I started it, and I know Rose got the book. And so, um, but what I wanted to, you know, it's interesting that um, if you wanted, to, if you wanted to leave, I'm going to have to wind it up anyway in a little bit. I'm getting up early in the morning, and um, um, I have some predictive coding that I need to go to bed. <laughs> but what I want to say to you, and then I'm going to let Rose say goodbye too is that um, if you were to say one thing to our listeners on the record, because we're gonna send this recording out, it just needs to be heard by the 3 million thousand people on the mind-body syndrome, you know, this 
amazing Facebook page. But what what would you like to say to our listeners and um, about the pain habit and about them being responsible for them, their pain and how they can get, how can we inspire them to get? Yeah. Um, if I went back to my inspiration, uh, uh, Professor Lauren Mosley maybe just um, kind of challenging me to say, well, it's interesting, but that was my resistance, wasn't it? To either push past or, or let go. But beyond that fear of being ridiculed and 48 year old man starting an academic career and or restarting and research and uh, it was easier for me just to not do it but on the other side of our fears is a life that's so amazing that it's within touching distance but you do have to take the first step and he if, if i if i think of I, I quoted this in the book i think he said i, I didn't in the book actually I, I think i quoted in the article i wrote recently and it's um recovery for patients in persistent pain or chronic pain recovery is now on the table he says this in a it was a it was the title of one of his recent courses and i looked at it, i thought it's never not been on the table it's never not been on the table it's always been accessible i think without being too political uh we've been dumbed down we've been muddy, been given muddy water to look through we don't realize that the power to recover is childlike and intuitive it doesn't mean it's easy Beautiful. but it is within touching distance and for anyone in pain if you can reach out to find someone who you think you can connect with that will listen to you and hear your story um then if 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 it is right for both of you you'll be able to help uh, each other and I think if you from my perspective as a if I told if I was telling a new qualified clinician I would say to them if you focus on the pain you won't see the person and Beautiful. If you, you look yeah. at the person stand back these seven minute appointments and GP surgeries I'm sorry for the GPs I really am no oh, these 20 minute hospital appointments and even my 30 minutes that I have with patients as a, I think I need, sometimes need a little more. And my wife who's recently helped in the practice since lockdown, we've scaled back and it's more of a lifestyle business and it's a lovely balance. Um, I'll spill over time and she'll come knock on, I hear a knock on the door, be like, <laughs> my next patient's waiting. She'll, and she'll give me the eyes. <laughs> just, you know, talking that pain rubbish, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the work to be done we can all all of us oh can do it. there's nothing goodness. special about me nothing special oh about my me goodness we're gonna we're gonna hurt some feelings the next go <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna knock some doors down we're gonna yeah listen this is the future and we're not against medicine we are about integrating mm -hmm. integrating absolutely, absolutely wow. yeah wow. i saw a dog i saw i saw a pediatrician this morning with nine years of shin pain. Always had pain, always had pain. Worse recently, I've been running what running from. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm so depressed. And I said, I, I, quit, I give her a quick explanation. She went, I said, is that okay? She said, wow, you nailed it. I said, you're gonna be fine. I said, this pain, the flare up is gonna go. Yes, you've been loading the running because you're moving house and changing rotation and the kids and blah, blah, blah. I said, but stick with this and you'll be pain free. Wow. Yeah. That's it. That's it, isn't it? Drew, thank you so much for sharing your information. Thank you so, so much for the yeah. way you've presented it. It's just been beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Tova, can you put up the book again, please? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, so, I've, been, um, I've been putting it up all over Facebook. Yeah. Uh, can thank you me. put it here now? I advertised so it on can, Facebook. It's on our page like three times. And yeah, Drew, I, Drew's red hair is on our picture, our face, and his shirt says, your shirt is fine. You tell that boy, Tony, your shirt is fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. And anyone who wants any other questions answered will refer to Drew, or Drew will maybe look at the at the page yeah. maybe later on or tomorrow. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, of course, it's the beginning of the day here in Australia, so I'll be able to follow up any questions that anyone didn't like to ask at the time, but would like to know. So thank you again, Drew. And it's just been an absolute pleasure meeting you.
Yeah, I've really enjoyed your company. I only wish one day I will meet you. And I, I can follow through on my hug. No, well, we're on lock. We're still on lockdown, so you're not going to see me very. Thank God for the internet. Let's just thank God that your dad came and visited, and said some beautiful words. And thank God for the internet that we're we can do this every week. And we will have you back because Rose and I are going to do this for a long, long time. So part two, we'll have. You I'm going to write another book. I'm going to have a book in mind. Good. Well, we'll have you back before that, before, during, and after. So bless your right. heart. Thank you so much, Rose. God bless. Have a wonderful okay. night. Okay, bye-bye. Good bye. night, bye -bye. you too.